had ever done it before, over 38 kilometres. From a surveyor's point of view, that is a unique achievement. The Tunnel Tigers basked in their achievement. I think it's great. We've gotten past halfway, so I suppose, in a way, we beat the French. So the British won the tunnelling race. But if the French had got to the RV point first, there would have been a wait while the Brits scrambled to catch up. Here's why. Job done, the TBM's only value was a scrap. But two machines were stuck head to head in a monster gridlock. One side's machine had to go. But what do you do with an 1100 ton TBM that's passed its use by date? Bury it. It was agreed that the British TBM would dive below its French counterpart to be entombed forever, a hundred metres below the surface of the channel. As man and machine were parted after three years, it was a poignant moment for the Tunnel Tigers. You see the machines buried and you get a bit of a twinge, you know. The French TBM was towed to Britain to be scrapped. So the Brits made the first breakthrough, but a French vehicle took the first trip under the channel. Over the following months, the four other main tunnels met up in a flurry of breakthroughs. Tunnelers carved out hundreds of linking cross passages every few hundred metres. They drilled out the air pressure shafts. They finished off the crossover caverns. May 1991, the Channel Tunnel was finally dug. The most important thing is that you can stand behind us and look straight through, and that's it. For the French too, there was a tremendous sense of the significance of the moment. It's an historic moment. Napoleon tried to build a tunnel but failed. Now we have one Europe. But behind the scenes of celebration, there was one group who weren't quite so jubilant. The tunnel's financial backers. The French and British might have dug the world's longest undersea tunnel, but delays saw the budget soar from 1.3 billion to over 2 billion pounds. And the job of building the international transport network serving the tunnel had only just begun. As the tunnelers headed home, another army of workers took over. They would build two huge terminals on either side of the channel, lay 195 kilometers of railway track, and to extract the heat generated by high-speed trains, fit a giant cooling system, equal to a quarter of a million domestic fridges. They would also build new trains, designed to carry cars, trucks and people through the tunnel. But if the tunnel's investors had any hopes that phase two of the project would come in on time or budget, they were in for a big disappointment. Two years later, overruns had driven the spend higher than ever. The terminals. The track. The trains. They all bust the budget. May the 6th, 1994. The Queen and French President Mitterrand opened the Channel Tunnel. A year late. Delays and interest charges had racked the total cost up to £10 billion. Enough to launch 33 space shuttles. Financial institutions of many countries collaborated to finance this, the biggest privately funded construction project ever undertaken. But business wasn't booming. First, the tunnel trains could only take trucks. It was six months before the tunnel could handle cars and passengers. A cross-channel trip by ferry from Britain to France takes an hour and a quarter. 
using the tunnel slashed the journey to just 35 minutes. But take-up was low. Some speculated that people were fearful of being underground if there should be a disaster. Meanwhile, high interest rates and massive competition from ferries and airlines dragged the tunnel even deeper into debt. And then, just when things seemed at rock bottom, everyone's worst fears were realised. By 1996, the Channel Tunnel has been open for over a year, but business is poor, and the tunnel is about to face its darkest hour. November the 18th. Songat, on the French side of the Channel Tunnel. 9.48 p.m. Freight train number 7539 approaches the tunnel, bound for England. On board, a deadly cargo. A truck has caught fire and is gushing smoke and flame. Railside workers had spotted the blaze and immediately reported it, but the train is already several kilometres in, under the sea. One of the 31 passengers on board is British truck driver Brian Shilton. And all of a sudden, we started to see this black, jet black smoke rising, coming in from the floor of the carriage. The truck drivers are riding in a passenger coach behind the engine. The fire starts 400 metres away, but it's getting closer. Bill Welsh of the Kent Fire Brigade will later that night find himself face to face with the Channel Tunnel fire. We were talking about the most severe fire you can ever imagine. It really was like looking in to a furnace, if you can imagine what that's like. Welsh's first concern, how to rescue the passengers. There's no way out. It's not like you're in a house, you can get out the doors, the windows. When you're in a tunnel, you're relying on someone coming to rescue you. At 9.51 p.m., the fire control centre advises the driver to keep going. Speed helps suppress the flames, and the train is only 15 minutes from the other side. US fire expert Ed Comeau will later help British and French investigators sift through the charred wreckage of the train. Part of the standard operating procedures is to allow the train to continue through and emerge on the other side where they would fight the fire and suppress it. The train accelerates deeper into the tunnel, racing for the English coast. At 9.57, the crisis takes a horrifying turn. A dashboard light warns the driver that a wagon fitting has come loose. The train must stop or risk derailment. As the train comes to a halt, the fire erupts. It quickly burns through the train's power supply. The lights went in darkness. It was just like something out of hell. Within three minutes of the power loss, toxic black smoke engulfs the train. We was lying on the floor, all choking. One or two drivers started to vomit. The train is 19 kilometres into the tunnel, but safety lies just a few metres away in the service tunnel. To reach it, the passengers must find one of the cross passages in the main tunnel walls. But the smoke is too thick to see the way out. The driver and the crew could not see where the door was. They couldn't see the safety lights. So they were stuck there. They were waiting for someone to come and open that door and help them. 10.02 p.m. Using fire sensors, controllers identify a hot spot in the main tunnel that they think must be the train. They open the nearest cross passage door remotely. The controllers now direct French firefighters into the central service tunnel to cross passage door number 4101. It's the one they think is nearest to the passenger coach. It's a 15-minute journey. 
and for the stranded passengers, time is running out. In the tunnel, trucks are now exploding. Tires on the lorries all blowing. The train was just rocking from side to side on the truck and that was actually happening while we was lying on the floor. The temperature climbs. At its peak, it will reach a thousand degrees centigrade. So hot, the train's steel wheels are welded to the rails and the concrete lining of the tunnel itself becomes dangerously unstable. It's where the moisture within the concrete expands and then it explodes out with terrific force. Very much, I would imagine, like shrapnel in a war situation. 10.20 p.m. Firefighters arrive at cross passage door 4101. But to their horror, there's no train. It's the wrong door. The chances of saving the passengers are receding fast. Fire is raging through a train halted 19 kilometers into the Channel Tunnel. In choking smoke, 31 passengers await rescue. The flames are just 200 meters away and closing fast. But firefighters have gone to the wrong section of the tunnel. Aboard the train, the conductor spots a bubble of clean air through the smoke. There must be an open escape route nearby. It's their only chance. The passengers must leave the carriage and plunge into the inferno. We saw the flames rushing alongside the train, the vehicles blowing up, and tyres and tanks going on the trucks. I would say we came within minutes of dying. All of us. For seven minutes, the passengers wander blindly through the acrid smoke. With eyes streaming and lungs bursting, they reach the open cross-passage door. <laughs> At 10.24 p.m., the passengers finally find the firefighters. It's 40 minutes since the fire was reported. We was just very, very lucky on that night to be alive today. No lives were lost, but it was a grim reminder of the perils of an emergency so far underground. One or two of them were near to collapse. They'd endured 20 minutes of having to breathe in acrid smoke, uh, and it was very fortunate that we didn't lose any lives. But, but the system worked, the system worked. After the fire, an urgent safety review. It results in improved fire sensors, better emergency lighting, and promises a quicker future response from firefighters. The tunnel was repaired and reopened in just two weeks, but the damage to its image would take longer to overcome. 1999, the last year of the century, the last year of the millennium, at last, a good year for the Channel Tunnel. More than five million cars and trucks travelled on the underground rail link between the British and French coasts. Nearly seven million people used the passenger service that links London, Paris and the Belgian capital, Brussels. Ten years on, and nearly 150 million people have travelled through the tunnel, that's more than twice the UK's population. Now, Britain and France are to be brought even closer via a new high-speed rail link from London to the tunnel entrance. Trains reaching 300 kilometers per hour will speed passengers to Paris in two hours, 15 minutes, half the journey time of the pre-tunnel era. So far, the line's on budget and on schedule. It will complete a vast pan-European transport network. At its heart, the Channel Tunnel itself. 11 men lost their lives while building the Channel Tunnel. For British Chief Engineer Gordon Crichton, the tunnel stands as a permanent testament to them and to all those who built it. 
people were proud to work on it. And I really think